uh, shared a beautiful eulogy, but this has been a time of a lot of our family wrestling and struggling with mourning, and, and it makes me, it actually fits really well where we're going today, but I want to ask you this question. When was the last time your heart was broken? I want you to think back to a time where you suffered loss. And listen, let's be honest, part of living in this fallen world is hurt, right? We've been through pain. We've all been through. I remember when I lost my father, suddenly the, the, the mourning and the grief that came with it was, was actually, interestingly, it happened a year after he passed. Maybe some of you can relate to that. But in this fallen world, we suffer loss, we suffer pain, and we end up in times of mourning, right? And, you know, when we talk about mourning, we always go to, well, when someone passed, I mourned. But have you ever mourned for something else? I'm going to tell you something. Some of my strongest mourning has not been for someone who's passed. It's been for something entirely different. You ever have the death of a, of a dream where you've got something you wanted to do and all of a sudden the door just gets slammed and you mourned over it and your heart was broken over it? Or the death of a relationship. Some of you have struggled with mourning because you've had a relationship that has fallen apart. And it's interesting, I've spoken to people who have had a marriage fall apart because the spouse has been unfaithful. And I actually had one person tell me one time, it would have been easier had they died. But you know, we mourn a lot of things, Right? And it's important for us to remember, and I thought it was just appropriate that this week as we're dealing with mourning, the passage that comes up in our study, we're doing the study of the Beatitudes, the passage that comes up is, blessed are those who mourn. Now, before we go any further, let me just remind you, we opened up talking about the Beatitudes last week, and we talked about the fact, a couple things that I think are really important for us to remember. First is this, in this list that Jesus gives, He's not, this is not a boring list of statements of blessing. This is actually, they should be read as exclamations. So when you read blessed here, you should be thinking, you are so blessed. Or all the blessings that go along with this character trait that you're going through. Because God says these things, these blessings that come out of these hard times are tremendous. They're amazing. They more than balance the struggle and the trial that you're walking through. And so I want to encourage you, when you read the Beatitudes, don't read them boringly. Read them with excitement. That, oh, what a great blessing we have because of what we're living through. And the other thing I want you to remember is this. These blessings are present tense. It means what Jesus is saying, he's saying right now, where you're at right now, even as you're going through this trial, even as you're going through this struggle, even as you're mourning right now, you are blessed. You're not waiting for it to happen someday in the future. You already have this blessing. And what's beautiful about that is if they're present tense, that means they are with you now and they will be with you forever. Last week we looked at the study of the blessed of the poor in spirit. We talked about the fact that the person who's poor in spirit is the person who realizes they can't please God. That they're far apart from God, that they're sinners, and they need to be saved by God's grace. And God says, Jesus says, the promise you receive is because you realize you need God's grace, you receive God's grace and when you receive God's grace, you receive the kingdom of heaven. Meaning you're with him forever. Today we're looking at the second promise here. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Turn there, we're going to read it directly from the passage. Matthew chapter 5, beginning, or actually not beginning, just, um, just reading one verse. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Now listen, we talked last week about the fact that one of the things we have a hard time with with these, these blessing excitements is that the things that God says are going to bring blessings to us don't always look like blessings, right? Sometimes they look like hardships. They look like problems. And God says, you know what? You're still blessed. You're blessed as you go through this, as you develop this character trait. You're blessed as you walk through this trial. You're blessed. And this one today is probably the one that when I first read the passage, I scratched my head the hardest over this. Because I want you to see what it says here. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will what? They shall be comforted. Now listen, from a purely human perspective, you know what my response would be? 
Well, that's great, but it would have been better not to mourn. This is the one where you kind of look at it and say, well, is, is the payoff, is the blessing really all that great? I'm gonna, we're going to get to that. It really is that great. It's really that amazing. But I want you to see here, it says, listen, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, let me just step back here real quick. I want to tell you something. This passage is actually one of the harder the Beatitudes to deal with. And actually, there are about three different ways people come at this passage, and we're going to walk through all three of them. Because what I think is this, I think this beatitude is like an onion. I was going to say this beatitude is like an ogre, trying to be cool and hip, and then I realized that that movie is 25 years old. That's not cool and hip anymore. Okay. But what do I mean by this? I mean, I mean it's got layers. It's got a deep understanding, a deeper understanding, and then it's got this deepest understanding that if we really get our head around the deepest understanding, then we'll really see the comfort of God. So we're going to walk through all three of those. I'm going to start real, real fast with this first one. Blessed are those who mourn. This is the, the, the basic, but even the basic understanding is deep. It's this idea that you are blessed when your heart is broken. You are blessed when you go through trials. You are blessed when that relationship falls apart. You're already living in blessing when you're suffering the loss of a loved one. And some of you are going, that does not sound like a blessing at all, Jack. And it doesn't. But remember, this is a kingdom manifesto. Jesus is saying, my, my kingdom works different than the world. But he says, you are blessed even as you walk through the morning. You're blessed because you're already receiving the comfort of God. And so the most basic understanding is this. God comforts us when our hearts break. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever had a time where your heart breaks and the love of God is just so near to you? Or just as beautiful when the people of God are so near to you and you receive the comfort of God from when your heart is breaking. Here's the problem. Sometimes we walk through our... Um, we walk through our trials, we lose a loved one, we lose a relationship, we lose an opportunity, and what happens is we get so caught up in the pain and the loss, and, and we just forget about the God who wants to give us comfort. And some of you are probably here today, and you're mourning something, and you're struggling with something, and I want to give you some promises of God about your time of struggle and your time of mourning. The first is this, and I'm going to have you look at a couple of passages there, because some of them are really, really neat and really cool, we want to get our heads around. Turn over to uh, Psalm chapter 56, verse 8. Sometimes when you're mourning, sometimes when you're hurting, you feel like you're the only one who knows, right? You ever go through a period of mourning, and you go through a period of time, and everybody else seems to be moving on, and you're still stuck, and you kind of feel forgotten, Here's the first promise I want you to understand when we're walking through mourning. The promise of God's comfort is this. God cares about your pain. God cares. Listen, don't let that slip past you. I want you to wrap your head around this. The God of the universe, the God who made everything, the God who is in charge of everything, he cares about your pain. He's paying attention to your pain. Psalm 56 David is dealing with a time of struggle. He's being attacked from all sides. He's being assaulted by his enemies. And you know what he says? He says in Psalm 56, verse 8, he says, You have kept count of my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Do you catch how beautiful that is? The God of the universe knows what you're going through. And even as you're not keeping a record, he's keeping a record. Every, every time you go through a heartache, you know the God of the universe writes it in his book. And I thought it was just beautiful, the idea that the God of the universe is catching my tears in his bottle. He's not wasting my tears. He's not forgetting my tears. He's there and he says, I care so much, I'm collecting these tears and I'm remembering what you're going through. And some of you are here today and you're not going through a time of mourning, you will. That's part of our fallen world. When you get there, remember, God is holding your tears in his bottle. That he's writing, he's keeping a record. As you're tossing in bed at night and your heart is broken, he's counting every toss. 
I think sometimes we hear this so much we forget how amazing it is. But he's keeping track. God cares about your pain. The other thing is in Hebrews chapter 4. Turn over there. Not only does God care about your pain, God understands your pain. You ever try to, count, you ever try to comfort someone and they are suffering such a loss that you just can't get your head around it? As a pastor, sometimes I have to come along, alongside people that are struggling and they're having such a loss and I don't understand it. I've never been there. I can't feel their pain yet. I want you to understand, our God feels our pain. In Hebrews chapter 4, we're told that Jesus is our high priest. And beginning of verse 14 says, Since we have a, high, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What you're going through, it, it's, it's, could you imagine, and I'm, I'm not trying to mock anybody, but could you imagine if your source of hope was the sayings of Confucius? Or the teachings of Buddha? Or even, even, even the teachings of the Quran, which are, are kind of cold and distant. Because all of them are built around philosophy and thinking and ideas. But you know what? Our faith is not built around ideas or philosophy. Philosophy and ideas have flowed out of it. You know what our faith is built around? It's built around the person of Jesus Christ. And the person of Jesus Christ is God who loved us so much that he left heaven and came and lived with us for 33 years so that he could not only save us but also sympathize with us. When you're going through your time of mourning, this is something I, I try to encourage myself with. When you're going through your time of mourning, remember that Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he suffered loss. We believe that Joseph probably died when Jesus was young, so he suffered the loss of his earthly father. But imagine, he lived in a, he lived in a fallen world. He saw death all around him. He struggled. He had mourning. He, he walked through the same pain that we walked through. So when we come to him and we're struggling and we're mourning, you know what? He understands. He's not going to give you an idea and say, well, think about this. He's going to say, here, come here. I love you. Let me hold you. Because he's walked there with you. So first thing is this. God knows your pain. God understands your pain. But not only does he know and understands your pain and understands your grief, God promises that he will comfort you in your time of loss. There are some beautiful things that the Lord says to us about comfort. In Psalm 34, 18, David's writing in, he says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. God promises that when you're hurt and when you're broken, when you, when you don't know where to go, and you feel like you're alone and you feel like you're separated, he promises at that time, that's when I'm going to come close to you. That's when I'm going to be as close to you as I've ever been. He says, I am close to the brokenhearted and I comfort the crushed in spirit. The question is not whether or not God's there when we're hurting, by the way. The question is whether or not we're paying attention and allowing him to give us the comfort that he wants to give. He says, I'm near to the brokenhearted. He promises that he's not going to leave you. In Hebrews, he tells us that I will never leave you or forsake you. One of the greatest lies that Satan tries to tell us is you're alone. You realize as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're never alone. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to walk with you through your grief. I'm going to walk with you through your trials. I'm going to walk with you no matter where you go. I am there with you because I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And here's the final thing that we see with God in comfort in our time of loss. When our heart is broken, God says, I'm going to be there with you. I care about you. I'm going to walk with you. And then he says this other thing that's amazing. And he says, I am going to use your grief. I don't know about you guys. I take great comfort in the fact that even when I'm going through trials and when I'm going through tribulations, God is still in control. As a matter of fact, I've shared this before, but I'll share it again. When my father passed and I was trying to take care of my mother who was very ill, you know what? I remember mowing the lawn at his house 
just to get out of the house. Mowing the lawn and repeating to myself over and over again Romans 8, 28, and 29, which I'm going to read to you here. Turn, turn with me if you would, because if you don't have this, this passage marked, you need to have it marked. Romans 8, 28, and 29 is one of the great promises of Scripture. And unfortunately, we, we only read part of it half the time, but we need to read all of it. And he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I want you to take comfort in this. When you go through trials... Our God is standing right there with you. He's walking with you. And he says this, listen, I'm not going to waste this pain. I'm going to take this pain and I'm going to use this pain to make you more like Jesus. Listen, this is part of life. We're going to mourn. We're going to struggle. We're going to have loss. We're going to have pain. And it's, it's a comfort to know that as I go through all these things, my God walks with me. My God cares about me. And most of all, my God is going to take me out the other end and make me more like Jesus. You guys track with me? I hope you're getting how important this is and how, how, how real this is. But here's what I want you to do. We're talking about, he says, hey, blessed are you when you mourn because you're going to receive comfort. Let's talk about what this comfort looks like. For those that are suffering loss and your heart is broken, here's the promises of God. He says, take comfort in knowing that I know. Take comfort in knowing that I care. And here's, here's the awesome thing. We have a God who knows. We have a God who cares. And we also have a God who's big enough to do something about it. So take comfort in the fact that I know. Take comfort in the fact that I care. Take comfort in the fact that I'm not leaving you. I'm not going to leave you. You're not going to be alone. And when you go through it and you come out the other end, you're going to be more like Jesus because of what you've walked through. All right? So you're going to walk through trials. And I want to say that that's, I told you we're going to go through three layers here, right? You guys make it through layer one with me? Did I lose anybody? Here's the thing. There's a, there's a deep and this is pretty deep, that the God of the universe cares and wants to, serve, wants to walk with us. But you know, it actually goes even deeper than this. Here's the thing. I don't think what I just shared is really the best understanding of the mourning we're talking about in this passage. And let me explain to you why. If you walk through the Beatitudes, all the other Beatitudes say, when you basically develop this Christ-like character, or you have this Christ-like character, or when you have this struggle that goes along with your faith, then you'll receive this blessing. But what we're talking about so far is just the human condition. Everybody who's ever walked on this, on this planet has walked through mourning, right? Everybody who's ever going to walk on this planet is going to walk through mourning. So if all that we were getting a promise here was this, when you mourn, you'll be comforted, this will be totally different than all the other Beatitudes. Which is what makes me think that that's not the full meaning of this passage. We can take great comfort in this. When my heart is broken... God cares. When I'm weeping, God weeps with me. But here's what I want to challenge you with. God's not just saying, hey, I'm going to be there when you're struggling. What he's saying to you is this. Not only do I want to weep with you, I want you to weep with me. So you know what, we're, what Jesus is really calling us to? He's saying, great, when you mourn, God cares. But let me ask you this question. When God mourns, do you care? You ever stop and think about the fact that God mourns? That God weeps over certain things? That there are things that break God's heart? And how often do the things that break God's heart actually break our heart? And I think what Jesus is saying, listen, when you get to the point where your heart breaks over the same things that God's heart breaks over, that's when you'll really see comfort. When your heart breaks because of the things that, that make God sad, then God comes alongside and he pours supernatural comfort into your life. But we have to stop and think, what breaks God's heart? Have you ever thought about what breaks God's heart? What makes God sad? Let me share a couple passages with you. I want, I want to walk through these. And this is, this is the deeper level. This is, we've gone deep, now we're going deeper. God mourns over the world we live in. How many of you watch the news? Pray for you. 
When you watch the news, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them myself, I've stopped watching most news. I, I try to stay informed. I know some of you are probably judging me for not being informed, but I'm happy. Um, <laughs> listen, here, here's, here's what usually happens with me when I watch the news. I see a broken world. I see horrible things happening. And what would be the wonderful thing would be if when I saw those horrible things happening, my heart broke. But you know what happens more often than not? I get mad. And I realized several years ago that people are making a lot of money by keeping me mad. That's why I stopped listening to them. But I want you to understand, sometimes we watch the world around us and we start to look at the people that's in the news and we say, oh, those people are so evil. I just wish I could squeeze their head. Maybe that's just me. I had one person tell me, I just wish I had a button that I could shock people. But here, here's, here's the thing. You know, when God looks at our world, you know what he does? He weeps. Aren't we thankful, by the way, that the God of the universe looked down from his throne, saw his lost creation, and wept and said, let me send a deliverer for them? God says to us, Jesus says to us, you'll be blessed when you mourn like my father mourns. When you weep over the state of this fallen world. And listen, when we weep over the state of this fallen world, you know that we're imitating the character of Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke. I told you we're going to pop a lot of passages today. I want you to see a lot of things here because there's a lot going on here. Luke chapter 19. Yeah, I'm going to give you the background here. Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is God. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows what the Father's plan has been all along. He knows that he's heading into Jerusalem, and when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be turned over to the authorities, and he's going to be crucified. And he's going to, he's going to suffer one of the most humiliating and painful deaths in history. And as he comes to the hill, and he crests over the hill, and he sees the city of Jerusalem, it says, when he drew near... And saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the, day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon the other, because you did not know the time of your visitation." And turn over with me, if you would, to Matthew 23. We'll see the same story in Matthew 23, the same, the same event. It says, Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you're not willing. See, your house has left you des desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is walking towards Jerusalem, and he sees the city that's going to crucify him. Listen, in a week's time, they're going to be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, and he knows it. In a week's time, they're going to say, give us Barabbas. Put this man to death. And what is his response when he sees these, these people who are lost and opposed to him? He weeps. I want you to say, you know what breaks the heart of God? He mourns over those who are separated from him. He weeps over those who reject him. He wants all of the people he died for to come to a saving knowledge of himself. His heart breaks over the fact that some are going to spend eternity in hell. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time your heart broke for someone who was lost? I struggle with that. I'll be honest. But if we're reflecting the heart of God, I want you to think about the person in your life who doesn't know Jesus. Is your heart breaking over the fact that they're facing a Christless eternity? Is your heart breaking over the fact that they don't know the God you know who gives you peace and strength and helps you walk through this life? Does your heart break over the fact that they have no support in this world? That they're trusting in a false belief system? Our heart should break over the lost. 
Ezekiel 33.10 is another verse that we should wrap our heads around because it shows us the heart of God towards the lost. He says this, God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but wishes they would repent. God's not out there going, I wish I could squeeze their heads. That's me. That's my problem. But you know what you know, uh, disturbs me a little bit? I think as a church, not necessarily this church, but as the church, we are often calloused towards the lost. We're harsh and we're cold towards the lost. And we often take this mindset, well, yeah, they're in a mess, but they're in a mess because they made that choice. And I want you to remember what we talked about last week. We were making a whole bunch of bad choices before the Holy Spirit convinced us of our poorness in spirit and our need for God's grace. Be careful when we judge the people around us. Instead, remember that God loves them and wants to bring them to salvation. I saw this play out about 20 years ago. And I'm not telling you the story to tell you that I'm super spiritual, because I'm not. But I was at a conference about 20 years ago, and we were in the middle of the, of the war in Iraq at that time. It was a Christian conference, and one of the speakers got up to announce that two of the guys on the most wanted list had been killed in a gunfight. He said, we killed these guys, and the whole conference of 2,500 people erupted in cheers. He said, yeah, that's right, we got them. And you know what went through my mind? Two men just went into a Christless eternity. And 2,500 Christians on the other side of the world didn't care enough not to cheer. Now, let's be honest, we've all been there, right? We've all been part of that crowd cheering. But if we really reflect the heart of our God, it would break our hearts when evil people die. Now listen, let me tell you this. Those two guys were bad guys. I'm not saying justice wasn't served. I'm saying my heart should have been broken, not celebrating over the fact that they were going into a Christless eternity. God weeps over the lost, and we need to weep over them as well. And when we weep over the lost, we will receive the comfort of God. But not only does he weep over those who are far from him or separated from him, have you ever watched the news and just seen what a mess our world is? All over the world, there are people who are struggling and suffering and dying because we live in a sin-filled world, right? And sometimes we say, well, you know what? Those people are way over there. They're not really my concern. And listen, I'll be honest with you. We can't help everybody. I get that. But you know that when we, when we watch what's going on in the world and we see injustice, you know that God is bothered by injustice? God wants to bring justice. As a matter of fact, one of the things he calls his people to do is to pursue justice. Justice not just meaning people getting punished who should be punished, but people getting the help that they sometimes need. Look, if you would, again, back to the Gospels. Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9. I do know my numbers. I can, I can read them properly. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Jesus is going through his earthly ministry. And he says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers, that he will send out laborers into his harvest. See what happens here. Jesus is going through the cities of, Jerusalem, cities of Israel. He's, he's healing diseases. He, he's helping the sick. He's doing all the things that only Jesus can do. But he looks at the people and he says that he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What, what happened was Jesus saw them, and he saw them living in the midst of a fallen world. And he probably saw some of them living in poverty. He probably saw some of them wallowing in their own sin. He probably saw some of them that were just suffering under the pain of someone else's sin. And I want you to see what his response was. His response was he had compassion on them. If we're going to reflect the heart of our Savior, compassion needs to be part of that. 
Matter of fact, compa- compassion needs to be a big part of that. And here's what I think happens sometimes. I think in our flesh, we have this self-defense mechanism. But I don't know about you guys, compassion can be exhausting, right? Compassion can also lead you to feeling guilty and feeling like, feeling like man, now I've got to do something. And so often what we do is rather than having compassion with people, we actually have condescension towards them. Well, why is that person living on the street? He probably made a whole bunch of bad choices. You know what? He may have. But my call is not to figure out what choices he made. My call is to have compassion on him. Why is that person struggling? Because they did something wrong. Maybe. By the way, be really careful attributing to the judgment of God the condition of men. Because remember, there was a man who was born blind, and the disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, hey, why is this guy blind? Was it because of his parents' sin or was it because of his sin? You remember what Jesus said? He did it so I, he's blind so I can receive glory because I'm about to heal him. Listen, when we look around this world and we live in a fallen world and we see people that are hurting and in pain, we should be moved to compassion. And you know how you're, you can tell you're moved to compassion? Compassion is not just that feeling you get. When you're moved to compassion, you know it always follows compassion? Action. When you have compassion on someone who's struggling, you try to help them. Listen, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where people are going to struggle. And here's the, here's the thing that's frustrating to me. We know that on this side of heaven, we're not going to solve all the world's problems, right? But I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard Jesus' response when, when Judas talks about the woman who washed Jesus' feet and, and wasted all that precious oil washing Jesus' feet. And Judas says, oh, she could have given all that money to the poor and help people. Now, we know, because we know what Judas was thinking, that Judas was really going to steal that money. But Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with me, with you. I'm only here for a little while. I don't know how many times I've heard Christians misuse that passage. They say, well, we don't have to get involved in these things because the poor are always going to be there. We're just banging our heads against a brick wall. That's not what Jesus meant. Jesus meant right now, at this moment, is the only time she's ever going to be able to wash my feet. So that's the right thing to do right now. Next week, you can help the poor. Tomorrow, you can help the poor. You're always going to have the opportunity to help the poor. It was not an excuse not to help the poor. It was a call to get our priorities right. But so often, I hear Christians say, well, the poor are always going to be with us. So we shouldn't really get too involved in that. We should be involved in helping those who are struggling financially. I've heard people say, well, you know, yeah, we have this environmental issue. And, you know, the world is, there's all this pollution and all that. And praise the Lord, things are better. I remember when I was a kid, we had acid rain. You guys remember acid rain? But I've heard believers say, well, we shouldn't care about the environment because, you know, it's all going to burn anyway. And eventually the Lord is going to renovate this planet with, with fire. But in the meantime, he says, you're to be stewards of this planet. We're to have compassion. We're to be involved. We're to do the right things. We're to we- And think about this. If you built a beautiful house and you poured your heart and soul into it, and then you sold it or it was taken from you and you came back and you saw it in disrepair and abuse, wouldn't that break your heart? I believe that's how God feels about the planet that he gave us. And I'm not calling on you to go out and become eco-warriors. I'm just saying we should care and we should stop making excuses. Compassion, we should mourn over the things that break God's heart. All right. Now what's the comfort for that? When you mourn over the things that break God's heart, you know what he does? He gives you the opportunity to bring his justice and grace into the world. I'm a history guy. I was a history major before I became a pastoral major. Um, You know what's beautiful? Almost all the wonderful advances in our world, I'm not going to say almost all, but many of the great advances in our world, you know where they came from? They came from the compassion of Christians who got challenged by God to do something to help those who were hurting. We talk all the time about William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce helped abolish the slave trade in the English Empire. <laughs> and what's amazing, he, is, he, he fought. He said, you know what, God? It doesn't seem right that we should be holding other men in bondage. So I'm going to fight to, to abolish the slave trade. And he faced an uphill battle. But within two years of him getting the English government to recognize that the slave trade was evil and that they shouldn't be involved in it, the whole English Empire was turned on its head to fighting against the slave trade everywhere else. But it all started because God convicted his heart. 
and said, this isn't right. I have compassion on these people who are struggling, who don't look like me, who don't come from where I come from, but I realize that they need help. In that same time period, children were working in the mines. They were working in the, in the factories. They were dying. And Christians said, you know what? This is not good. Let us help the people who are hurting. And they advanced and they got some of the child labor laws that protected these children. And I want to make this clear real quick before you think I'm going this way. I'm not telling you that the polit political answer is the answer. What I'm telling you is when you see something that breaks God's heart, you should be jumping into it trying to help. And God will use you to bring his grace and justice into the world. And that'll be a comfort. And listen, we're going to be fighting these battles our whole life, but it'll be a comfort when we get to do the things that God calls us to do. We don't want to embrace a social gospel, but I want you to understand that there is a horizontal aspect to our gospel that we have to be engaged in. It's not enough just to preach. We also have to help. Not only will you get to do that, but you know what? When you mourn for the things that break God's heart, you have a promise. We can rejoice in the fact that we know that one day, one day, Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to make all things new. All these issues we're looking at, all these things that break his heart in the world, he's going to fix them all. And so when you, when you look out in the world and you say, Jack, I'm doing all I can, it just doesn't seem to make any difference, that's okay. Keep doing what God's called you to do and trust that he's going to finish the work someday. And that should be a comfort for all of us. We're not going to get this world right. That's not our call. Our call is to try to serve him as we live in a broken world, bringing his grace and justice wherever we can, knowing that he will ultimately fix it. All right, so first thing, God cares when you're mourning. He says, now, I care when your heart's broken. Do you care when my heart's broken? And this, the deeper stage of this mourning is understanding I, my heart needs to break for the things that break God's heart. And there's one more stage I want to take you to, and I think this is the one where we really struggle God, I want my heart to break for things that break your heart. But you know when we're really mourning is when we mourn for the way we break God's heart. Have you ever thought about how often you break God's heart? And when I talk about how we mourn when we break God's heart, what I'm talking about is this. We need to mourn over sin. We don't even like to talk about sin. We, de we definitely don't like to talk about our sin. We might have a great conversation about somebody else's sin. But I think what Jesus, the, the final level Jesus is taking you is this, and, and, and really it's beautiful because it ties right back into the other beatitude because all the beatitudes are, are linked. But in the previous beatitude, remember we're told to be, the blessed are the poor in spirit because they recognize their sin, they know their need for sin. Now the blessed are the mourn are those who have recognized their sin and their sin breaks their own heart because they realize I realize that my sin breaks God's heart if I really love God do I want to break his heart here's the thing we have to mourn over our sin and I don't think we do that near enough I know I don't do it near enough and you know why I think sometimes we have a wrong view of what sin is in order to truly mourn over sin, you know the first thing you have to do is you have to understand exactly how bad sin is. Exactly how evil sin is. We have to recognize sin for the evil that it really is. And I want you to just stop, and, and I'm going to give you some things that you already know, but I want you to wrap your head around it. Sin is the evil that separates you from God. Sin is the evil that that keeps you from having a relationship with the Father who loves you. Sin is the evil that, that, that just permeates everything and poisons everything in your life. Sin, not only does it, does it separate you, but you know the end of all sin is? The end of all sin is destruction. So often we think sin, you know, we, we think sin is something we can handle. I want you to understand Sin is not something you can handle. Sin is not something you can manage. Sin will always lead to destruction because that's the plan of Satan. We're told that Satan only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And you know his chosen toy, tool? Sin. Sin is destructive. And here's the last thing. Sin is what costs Jesus his life. I want you to imagine if you would 
if you had someone if you had someone who laid down their life to deliver you from a debt if you had someone who who took the death penalty for you someone you know who took the death penalty for you because you did something wrong and they took your punishment would you go out the next day and commit that same crime again But I want you to understand, our sin, the little sins and the big sins, by the way, there really aren't little sins, but the sins we consider minor and the sins we consider major, those sins put Jesus on the cross. And when we, when we go back and we visit those sins again after accepting the grace of the God of the universe, we're really thumbing our nose at the sacrifice Christ has made for us. Charles Spurgeon, uh, I came across a quote by him. Um, actually, I'm going to hold that for right now. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Look over to uh, James chapter 4. Which understand sin is the evil that separates us from God. Sin is, by the way, all these things that break God's heart, all this fallen world we're living in, all this evil we're looking at around the world, you know what the source of all of it is? Sin. So all these things come from sin, and yet we play with it day by day as though it's a minor thing. Um, when I was a kid, I went to a, How many of you went to Boy Scout camp when you were younger? All right, I went to a Boy Scout camp one time, and at this camp, at this camp they had a, a pit that they had built to keep snakes in. Now, I don't know about you guys. I, I think there's a great place to put snakes <laughs> far away. But mostly what they had in, those, in that pit was, was um, black snakes and, you know, little garter snakes and things like that. But I was walking on the path one day, and all these boys in front of me all circled around on the path, and they had in the midst of them a copperhead. Now, if you guys are familiar with copperheads, we have them around here. We have them a lot in North Carolina where I grew up. Copperheads are among the most dangerous snakes you'll ever deal with. I've actually seen people who catch rattlesnakes. They won't touch copperheads. But these boys had circled around the copperhead, and they said, we're going to take this snake, and we're going to put it in the tank. And they were gathering, and they were getting their sticks, and they were getting closer and closer. And as they did it, a scoutmaster came up and saw what was going on. They had these great big combat boots, because all my scoutmasters were Marines. And he saw the copperhead, and he looked at it, and he told the boys, get back. And he walked over, and he stomped on that snake's head. And he said, you boys don't understand what you were just doing. That snake as soon as you tried to pick it up, he was going to turn on you and he was going to bite you. And there's nothing you could have done to stop him because that's what copperheads are able to do. They wanted to play with the snake and he says, you were playing with poison. I want you to understand, we like to play with sin all the time. And we need to understand, it's poison. And you think you can play with it, you think you can handle it, but it's going to get you. And when it gets you, it's going to lead to destruction and pain in your life. And you say, well, Jack, I know Jesus is my Savior. I'm not saying you're going to hell. But what I'm saying is you will deal with the consequences of sin in your life. Look at King David, a man after God's own heart, but the sword never departed from his house after he sinned. Sin's a dangerous thing. So we need to weep over. What's this weeping looking like? What's this mourning looking like? James chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. James, the brother of Jesus, says this, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. I want you to hear this. James is writing here to a group of believers. He's writing to people who already know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. There's no New Testament book written to non-believers. He's writing to believers who know Jesus, and he says to them, cleanse your hands. Weep and mourn over your sins. Be wretched. Let this sin impact you. Let the seriousness of this impact you so that you know that you want to repent of it and turn away from it. Understand the cost of it. Feel the pain of it. Realize that when we go and sin, we're doing the very thing that made the cross necessary. When we go and sin, we, we, are, we are 
It's almost like we're placing Christ on the cross again. Weep because of what you've done. Weep because of what you're losing because of your sin. Mourn over the fact, here's the thing, you know sin does? Sin destroys relationships. Sin destroys your relationship with the Father. He destroys the relationship with other people. The other thing I want you to understand is, you know that every time you sin, it hurts at least two people? It hurts you. You say, well, my sin doesn't hurt me. Yeah, it does. Because you know what? When we sin, we build up calluses on our heart. We get more and more comfortable with the things of Satan, and we continue further and further into that sin. It also harms the Father. And let's be honest, most of our sins harm a lot more than two people. Some of you are walking through crisis and mourning because someone's sin has hurt you. Our sins harm us. Our sins, our sins harm others. Our sins create pain. We need to take these sins seriously. And when we're really understanding the heart of God, when we sin, it'll hurt us. It'll cause us to mourn. Now, here's the thing. We're promised here, says, when you mourn, you'll be comforted. When you're mourn, you'll be comforted. And what's, that's beautiful, right? Because when you actually have your heart broken over your own sin, you know what you do? You take it to the Father and you seek his forgiveness. And you know what the promise is? At the very end of that passage in James, it says, if you humble yourself, what's God going to do? It says, if you humble yourself, he'll exalt you. If you come to the point and you recognize how evil your sins are, even as a believer in Christ, and you take them to the Father, you know what he always does? He says, I will forgive you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Turn there if you would. And we're coming to the end. First John 1 John 1.9 says, Whoever says, I'm sorry. I've got to get to the right chapter. I, I tell you, I really do know numbers. Let me just... If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the comfort of God. When you recognize your sin, when you mourn over your sin, and you take that sin to the Father and you say, you know what, I confess, I agree with you that what I did was wrong and I seek your forgiveness. You know what we always have from him? We always have forgiveness. We always receive his grace. Your sin doesn't have to stay with you forever. We receive grace and forgiveness when we mourn over our sin and then Psalm 103, says something beautiful, says, says, my transgressions are always before me, Lord, but you've taken my sins and you've separated them as far from me as the east is from the west. Here's the comfort for the person who's mourning over sin. Your sins are forgiven when you take them to the Father, and when you take them to the Father, he takes them and he throws them away. He gets them away from you. They no longer count against you. You can have comfort in the fact that my sins, as bad as they are, they've been forgiven. But, you know, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a couple things to think about. You know you know when you're not mourning for sin? When you keep leaving the door open for the next sin. You know when you know you're not mourning for sin is when you're thinking in your mind, I'm going to do this thing and I know it's wrong and I'll ask forgiveness later. Because when we really understand the pain and the tragedy of sin, we want to avoid it. We want to repent of it. So let's look at a couple things real quick before we close. What do we need to do? How should we respond to this? First thing is this. We need to mourn over sin. We need to see how bad it is. We need to really recognize how bad it is. We need to stop rationalizing our sin. We need to stop excusing our sin and just say, Lord, what I'm doing is evil. Please forgive me for it. And then we need to repent over our sin. You know what repent means? Remit, repent means to change direction. Repent is this idea that I'm going this way, and I say, you know what, that's the wrong way. Let me turn this way and go that way. When we repent over our sin, you know what we do? We walk away from that sin, and we close the door behind us. I'm going to challenge you with this. So often we say we're repenting of sin, and we're actually repenting of the fact that we got caught in our sin. When we repent of our sin, we see sin for what it really is and say, Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. Give me strength and power to avoid it. Then we need to avoid sin. I told you earlier, I had a quote from Charles Spurgeon. This, this struck me. He basically says, the sin 
is what put Jesus on the cross. He said, therefore, I can't trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. Imagine if you would, someone murdered your best friend or murdered your spouse. Would you go to coffee with them the next day? Would you even say hello to him on the street? But yet here we are, sin killed our Savior, and we go palling around it every day. If we really mourn over sin, then what we're going to do is we're going to avoid it. And we're going to put things in our life to say, you know, Lord, I know that if I get involved in this thing, it's going to be sin for me. So I'm going to put a guardrail right here to help me, help me not fall into that. By the way, your guardrail is your guardrail, not everybody else's guardrail. But you're going to say, Lord, I want to avoid sin. And here's the last thing, and I want to share this because I think it's really important. And then we'll close. If you're mourning over sin, one of the things you need to do is thank God for his grace and forgiveness. What I mean by that is this. Understand, when you sin today, it should break your heart. The sin you confessed over yesterday is under the blood. Leave it alone. Leave it there. Because here's the beauty. God says, I'll take your sins and I'll separate them as far from you as the east is from the west. Don't go looking for the things God sent away. Because what's going to happen is you develop this ability to mourn over sin and to understand how bad it is and actually try to avoid it. Satan's going to get in your ear and say, yeah, but you did this. And you did that. And you've got to say, you know what, I did that. You're right. That was bad. But that's already forgiven. It's already gone. We don't need to wallow in our sins of the past. But we need to take seriously the sins that we face in the present. And then thank God that his grace is sufficient to cover all of them when we see them for what they really are. I think that if we would learn to mourn over the things that break God's heart, it would not only make a huge difference in our life, it would make a huge difference in the things all around us. And if we learn to truly mourn over sin and really repent over sin, our light would just keep getting brighter and brighter and brighter as we allowed the Holy Spirit to do the work in our life to help us to overcome these things. We're blessed when we mourn because God is the God of all comfort. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness and your mercy. We ask, Lord, that you'll break our hearts for the things that break yours. We ask, Lord, that you'll make us new as we repent and we follow after you. And we ask, Lord, that just your grace will be magnified in and through us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.